Oh, hello. It's okay with everybody. We can start. Good evening. Uh, good morning, depending on where uh, everybody is. Uh, it is a great honor for me uh, as director of Instituto Cervantes in Sydney to once again have along with us uh, for this uh, National uh, Week of Science here in Australia, uh, a new, once again, collaboration with SRAP. Uh, and uh, today we are taking uh, our first conference, uh, first of three during this week. Uh, and it is uh, an honor to present the online activity of stargazing, discovering winter in the southern sky. Here uh, in New South Wales, Australia, we have the honor to um, have among us uh, in the uh, Pablo Corso Caballero, Rami, um, Love and Cristo. Uh, Kristen, sorry, Baxter, and Anton, of course, Lopez, which is the who is the uh, president of ASTRAP, uh, along uh, with Instituto Cervantes of Sydney. Um, uh, we are here uh, to promote uh, science, to promote science in Spanish, to promote science among the university uh, sector, science among uh, scientists as uh, the whole in the framework of the uh, promotion of science that the general director of Instituto Cervantes uh, in Madrid headquarters uh, has required the 88 Instituto Cervantes around the world uh, to promote science uh, in collaboration with the Ministry of Science uh, in Spain and here uh, in Australia, it is an honor to work once again, uh, uh, and I hope uh, what for what will be for many more uh, chances to collaborate with the SRAP and with these um, highly um, representatives uh, in this uh, first uh, event, online event of stargazing uh, for this uh, annual um, week of the uh, science national science here in Australia. Um, without further ado, I would like uh, to pass um, uh, the, the, la palabra <laughs> uh, for Angel Lopez uh, to just start with the um, stargazing uh, online event. Uh, and please, um, we will be here at all times and hopefully um, accepting anyone that is joining in a bit late. We are also on YouTube streaming live for those uh, who prefer to access that way. Uh, and we will also be um, in uh, YouTube and SRAP, and we will also be in YouTube uh, Instituto Cervantes um, uh, later on. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us. And I'm very sure, very positive that you will enjoy this wonderful experience. Angel, cuando quieras, the floor is yours. Um, okay, everyone, thank you very much, Coral, for uh, this uh, beautiful introduction. Let me change to the other video because we actually are here in the backyard, in, in my place, with a couple of telescopes of four very good friends uh, that we are going to share our passion about astronomy. Uh, but I want to show not that camera, but the other camera. We have several cameras around here, and I put the wrong one. Of course, that, way. that is the one I wanted to show, that we are here very well seen. So um, it is my uh, privilege and my pleasure to, to be tonight uh, with uh, my friends, starting from uh, the, the, that part, and Rami Mado, Pablo Corcho Caballero, and Kirsten Banks, that uh, we are going to be uh, showing live a bit of the uh, the sky that we have tonight. We have more or less clear skies with some clouds around. And uh, I want this to be a conversation, not only me talking. Also, uh, you are very welcome to ask questions in uh, in the chat, in Zoom and in YouTube. It, we will try also to pay a bit of attention and we will be answering those questions as we go. Uh, but first things, perhaps, um, a knowledge country that we didn't do that. So, uh, Marang Yagyara, good evening. 
Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of which we are meeting today and showing you the stars or Gurulang, as we call them in Wiradjuri language. Uh, these are this is the <clears throat> Gurungai people that we are meeting on their land this evening to see the beautiful stars and see the beautiful Muriang, the sky worlds. So I'd like to extend my acknowledgement to the elders past and present of this land that we're meeting on and to any Indigenous peoples from Australia or from around the world who may be tuning into this broadcast this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Jesse, for that. Um, perhaps we should be having a how, how are people that we so this uh, event, it is much more thought about uh, using amateur telescopes. Um, everyone can actually go out and buy one of the telescopes and try to enjoy the night sky, as we have said many, many, many times in, in different events. And, and we can start with that. So perhaps the first thing it is uh, thinking about how do we know to read the map of the sky? Well, how we know to read the map sky is by looking at maps. And a thing that we've done for a very long time uh, is use star maps or atlases that were drawn on books and drawn on paper. Um, but these days we have um, some very cool little, uh, what's it called, programs that are digital that we can use to look at the night sky. And I'm going to share with you one now. This is called Stellarium. It is a free program that I love to use and I'm sure the rest of us really do as well. It's a fantastic program where you can set it to any location on Earth. Also, almost any location not on Earth as well. It's a really cool feature as well. Uh, and you can set it to any time too. So currently we've got my computer set to Sydney where we're broadcasting from and the current time as well, I believe. Yes, that looks like the current time. And we can have a look around and have a look at what's up in the night sky. So if we look over this way, what you're seeing here is actually what's up behind us at the moment towards the south. So you can see the Southern Cross, you can see the two pointer stars, and you can look around and just check out the night sky and see what's up. It's very useful. I have used it many times when I'm doing professional observing to make sure that my stars aren't behind the moon. So I've made that mistake before. Um, how about you, Rami? How do you use Delarium? Okay, well, I actually use it to, uh, with, with my telescope, I use it to track the stars. To, to find out what my next target is going to be like. So when I want to go look at what is my next target while well, I'm actually you know, capturing my first images. And um, to, as, as Kirsten said, to also check out what's coming up in the future. So there's, there's some really some nice stuff that, you know, some eclipses and um, where the planets will be at certain times of the year, especially around near sunset points um, and being able to check out where they are at certain points of the year and certain times of the year uh, makes it really spectacular to go in. And also, as Kirsten's showing right now, zooming in on those planets and seeing the moon and their positions in real time. That's also quite uh, a, a fun feature to have as well. I really like uh, looking at them and speeding up time to see them go around and see things. Flip. Okay. Also, we're seeing it flip because it's going back and forth underneath and in uh, the sky well. and then it's daytime as well. <laughs> yeah. you, you can turn off the atmosphere, which is actually quite nice. Yeah. I do like that yeah. feature too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but it's, all, it's also always sometimes good to have the atmosphere because it also shows you, you know, when you've got to start preparing for your telescope and, and catching your flats and your, and your bias frames and your dark et cetera. So it actually uh, it is quite useful as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Start this many times, and I, uh, I hope you don't mind I'm going to also to share the screen. Uh, I like to recommend this uh, sky map. Uh, that is skymaps.com. You can actually download it from, uh, from the web page. It is free to use. And it is a very clever way of showing all the stars. And for a start, for beginners, particularly for the kids, um, although, of course, they love technology and there are many apps that you can use actually for identifying your stars, I still think it is a very useful way. Perhaps I know the school, I know that I do, but I still think it is a good way of starting doing that. Also because uh, this particular map has uh, the calendar and some few things that are happening around, for example, a couple of days ago, Saturn was in a position that we will probably mention a bit more about that later, meaning that it's right now almost rising behind, uh, the, roof. behind the roof of my house. Oh. Um, and that view that you are seeing right now in the screen, it is uh, the view that we have exactly at this moment on top of us with the center of the Milky Way right there, almost in the zenith, or basically in the zenith. And the blue patch, it is actually the Milky Way 
We also have the Magallanic Cloud, the satellites of the Milky Way to the south, and the, in the ecliptic, that is the path of the sun, the parent path of the sun in the, the, that we see from Earth. It is where we are going to find the planets, for example, Saturn, it is uh, right now around Capricornius, and Jupiter should be rising a bit later, it is still not here. I like to show, for comparison, an image that I took a couple, I don't know, three or four years ago. Isn't that a great photo? Thank you. I have to show it. I have to show it. So that is uh, very similar to what we have right now. Not exactly, but very similar to what we have right now on top of us. Um, and that is something that I also wanted to connect to in order that if we want, if we really want to go and see stars, uh, we have to usually go to dark places. Right now you cannot see that, but we have a very big and very bright light pointing to us in order that we can, you can see us. And also a few more lights here and there, but hopefully it will be possible to, to see some few uh, of, the, of the objects. I'm not sure if I start showing the one that you already have, Rami. Yes, can I just like, add, add for another way of the question, really, and I think Kirsten just mentioned it a second ago, a really accessible way of actually uh, looking at the night sky and doing some night sky uh, viewing from your own backyard is there's plenty of phone apps these days that allow you to point your phone at any part of the sky and it tells you what you're looking at. And um, you know, something fun that kids can do, for example, is look at, uh, point out where the planets are, where Jupiter and Saturn are today, and then make a little note about that, and then go back in a few days and make another note where they are compared to the background stars and how high they are in the sky at the same time of the night. And over the course of a month or two months, you have a really nice little set of data where you can actually, you are collecting data from space about where the planets are in the sky, just by simply using your phone and using your eyes as well. Uh, but yeah, we can jump over to here now. Can we share my screen? We have some yeah. better eyes yes. in the form of how, how big is that telescope? Uh, this is a 20, uh, 20 centimeter telescope, so an 18 telescope. Yeah. Go. We will go to the. <laughs> We've been infiltrated. Oh. <laughs> Back to wholesome sky, sky stories. <laughs> All right, I'm sharing my screen now. I hope everyone can see this. It's coming up now. Yep. So this is a live image of uh, Omega Centauri, and it's coming up behind us. And it's literally in a sky not too, pretty almost above us. And it's a collection of about a million stars that are very old. Um, I think they're about uh, 12 billion years old. Something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. They're normally a bit more yellow than this, but I've got a special filter on my uh, on my camera at the moment, which is sort of taking away a little bit of that yellow light. But uh, there's about a million stars. Now, I'm going to try to zoom in, and hopefully you folks at home can see this as well. Um, so I'm just going to play around. And as we zoom in, you can see some of these fainter stars around here as well. It's coming through, okay? Yeah, it's looking yep. great. Perfect. Beautiful. Uh, so look at all these smaller, fainter stars in here. And uh, zooming back out. Uh, that's the big collection of stars there. It's a wonderful sight to see. It's bright enough to some, if you're from a very dark sky, you can actually see it as a small gray fuzzy patch from a dark sky you can. Uh, with, with binoculars, for example. I think some people can see it with their own eyes. My eyes aren't that great, but yeah. I've been able to spot it sometimes, yeah. even from Sydney Observatory oh, with my wow. eyes. Cause cool. you can find when you, cause you look to the two pointers, the two pointer stars. Yeah. I'm pretty, if I look behind and actually look for it myself, I'm pretty sure if you look from the, fainter of the two pointer stars and go up by about a thumb and a thumb, yep. you should about find it. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Very yeah. uh, useful astronomical measurements, the thumb. Yep. Yeah, 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 it is. That's one Indeed. degree, right? Indeed, it is. I should, I should know that. <laughs> Good. Okay, well, um, after showing and that, at least we have uh, a bit of uh, a beautiful uh, globular cluster. Uh, oh my God, Centauri. Omega, oh my God, Centauri! Yes. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> um, perhaps, and we have also described a bit how we do stargazing. Let's go to describe a bit of the telescopes that we have here. For that, if you don't mind, I'm going to share again my screen uh, with a particular um, a slide that I have uh, prepared uh, where we are. Uh, sorry for that. Too many things at the same time. As astronomers, uh, we often have many tabs open and many. Uh, desktops open as well. Let me see. I, I think I currently have oh, five or six again. open. And now yeah, I've got about ah, seven. Oh, I've, got, I've got a lot of those actually. I hate this. <laughs> when that happens, I hate that. <laughs> um, very scattered brains as astronomers. 
because it was full screen and then it didn't pick the presentation. Okay, let's try again. Now, now it should it should go. There, there it we is. Go. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. If you don't mind, I'm going to minimize this. It doesn't matter what you're seeing there. And um, um, good. So there, usually we can divide telescopes into three categories. So the standard telescopes that you might think about, and that are the Galilean refractor telescopes that are made of lenses. That is one of them my telescope here. Um, there is a second category which uh, the, of telescopes that they what they, we are using are mirrors. And that is the reflector telescope. So for example, the Newtonian reflectors or in a Dobson mount, that is the one that we have there in front of us that we are not using for tonight for seeing. We could just for ourselves, but not you, you will not see because we don't have any camera there. They're not that easy to, uh, I mean, with this kind of mount, it is not that easy to move around. And finally, we also have a third kind of telescope, which is the one that Rami is controlling, and that is a catadioptrix, which means that it's made of both mirrors and lenses, making in a very compact way, a, what we call a very focal, a very, a very long focal length, um, and being very uh, versatile. In, in order that we can see from nebula and diffuse regions, diffuse uh, galaxies, faint objects, to uh, put a lot of magnification into planets and the sun and the moon. And that is the telescope that uh, he's using. I'm going to ask you, which is your favorite telescope? Kind of telescope? The ones that are easy to use. <laughs> Very good answer. Which I would say the ones with the remote. The remote is great. The yeah, biggest I, one. The, the biggest. biggest one. Always the biggest. <laughs> <laughs> Most uh, expensive. I'm advice here when I say radio telescopes, because it's what I do outside of this. Oh. But, 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 but I'm talking about astronomy. About the optical telescopes, I like these ones. I love the... Uh, I think they give you a lot of uh, a lot of power and a lot of detail and in a very compact space. So I think they're my favorite. Good. Great. Um, so perhaps we can try to move to uh, a different target. And I see that. Do you have already done that? Rami so while it. we were talking, and I still have not moved my telescope, we Rami already have moved to another object. Please go for it. I'm so sure excited thing. for you all yeah. to see this I'm one. I'm going to um, share my screen again. So give me one second. This has just started, so it's just building up now. Um, one stick. And uh, so see in the chat, we have the best telescope is the most expensive telescope. And for my PhD bank account, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we're, we're looking at a new target now. This is, again, a live image. It's only just started collecting data about, and it's only got about 35 seconds of data so far. And what we're looking at is a galaxy that's about 12 million light years away, I believe. Yep. It's Fancy called that. Centaurus A, um, and it's a big sort of oval galaxy. I hope you can see my mouse moving around. Yes, yep. you can. So it's like a bit of an oval egg-shaped galaxy that is sort of building up now. And there's a second galaxy, which is like an edge on spiral, that's actually now intersecting it in here. And it's producing these beautiful dark dust lanes, which we see from our perspective. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's got a lot of, uh, because of this collision of these two galaxies, it actually has a lot of activity at the central supermassive black hole. So this galaxy is beautiful and bright in the optical wavelengths that we're looking at here. But it's uh, about 10 times more remarkable in the radio wavelengths when you actually see all that data come through as well. well Look, as much as you are biased on radio, I have to agree with you on that because this galaxy is just so cool. I love seeing the compilation of different wavelengths of light. If you go and find this photo on the internet, you have the optical, you have radio, you have the X-ray as well, and it just pops. It's so beautiful. I can look for it if you want. I have a very nice com uh, combination of that image later. Um, remember also uh, that that galaxy is so special, so magnificent. Uh, the closest they EGN to us, actually, yep, that's right. and, and radio galaxy, that if we could see in radio waves, the size of this galaxy would be something like 16 20, 20, no, 20, 20, 20, 20, okay, 10 yeah. degrees, yeah, yeah, 10 yeah. degrees, oh, okay, yeah. 10 degrees, oh, yeah. 10 yeah, degrees yeah. 20, yeah, 20, sure, yeah, yeah. 20 full moons, yeah, 20 wow. suns in the sky because of the very elongated uh, lobes, radio lobes that it has. Uh, perhaps I can try to find it uh, and show it later. Anyway, 
so and, that's and beautiful if, target. If, if, if I might add this, uh, this I'm, I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of Sydney here, but uh, this galaxy actually has a bit of Sydney history. Um, of course, yes. Actually, it has a lot of Sydney history. Uh, in 1826, this galaxy was discovered by James Dunlop from Parramatta in Sydney, and no one ever seen it before until James Dunlop saw it in 1826, and he thought it was a nebula back then, because back then, they didn't know what galaxies were. In fact, galaxies were only uh, sort of came around into the picture about 1926, almost 100 years after after Dunlop saw this, you know, and so uh, what we had was this beautiful nebula that Dunlop had seen. He saw a couple of others in the sky as well. And then a hundred years later, we figured out there's galaxies out there. And it wasn't until maybe, maybe like the 1950s and 1960s when there was a um, you know, radio telescope start to become developed and people started noticing a big radio bright object in the sky. Mm -hmm. And it was at the exact same location as this I object did. here. And they yeah. went, hang on. Maybe that galaxy and the radio galaxy and the optical galaxy are the one objects. And again, that radio discovery was made from Sydney. So both optical and radio of this galaxy were found from Sydney. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. That's awesome. It's a very cool history mm. about this. We have a special thing with this with this object. Again, it is one of, the, for me, one of the most beautiful galaxies out there. And we, as it is very close to us, because it's, again, 12 million light years, that is almost nothing. Mm. The, the distances to many other galaxies and we can resolve things there we can see many details and we now understand more or less that it's also the fusion of two objects that collided uh, some few billion years ago perhaps even less than that and that is why it has this dust lane that you have started to see now very well in the in the image I, I want to emphasize this this image we are taking it right now live using Rami's telescope from here. That's awesome. Yeah, great. Good. And I might just go and share my screen now to show you where you can find this in the night sky Please. with Stellarium. So here we are. So this is actually quite close to where we were looking beforehand, looking at Omega Centauri, which I will also show you too. So we've got the Southern Cross kind of on its side down here, which we can see. Well, we can. We, you can. You, you, you can. can. We, we can. <laughs> but you it can. is behind. It's in the it same is, orientation. There it is. And you've got the southern pointers above it as well. You can see this blue oscillating box here. That's where the galaxy is. So we're looking really close towards the south near the southern cross and the southern pointers. But you see this little smudge here to the left of uh, Centaurus A? That is Omega Centauri. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at, uh, now I can explain it when you can actually see it in front of you. And then you can see these two pointers, the fainter one of the two, Beta Centauri or Hadar. You go about a thumb length to one star, another thumb length, and you got that Omega Centauri blob. And that's how you find it. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, Perfect. Great. Okay, but um, don't, don't, don't uh, stop sharing the screen because something uh, very important uh, that uh, we already mentioned, although we are saving nine right now galaxies that we have already seen Omega, Centa uh, Omega Centauri, a stellar cluster, a cluster. In this, this time of the year, and um, with the Milky Way, the Zenith uh, in the Zenith just crossing all the sky, we have Sagittarius and Scorpio, and Scorpio there on the Zenith, very close, in the best position of the sky to see. So this is actually the best time of the year for observing stuff from in radiance, mm. aside the Orion Nebula, yeah. and in my case, Carina Nebula, which is starting to go a bit lower into the sky. I cannot get right now uh, Carina Nebula with my telescope. Perhaps you can do it, uh, Rami, if you want. Uh, it's, it's probably a little bit lower for me behind the trees as well. Okay, then, 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 on then, the, on then, screen, that little then, down then forget, we can, we can, we can show uh, an image if you want later, but what I want to show it is actually how we can also control the telescope, moving the telescope into a target. And I hope it works because I have not tested today. It worked <laughs> yesterday and it has worked for me many times. So you don't mind uh, stopping sharing the screen. And I'm going to do something funny with sharing the screen that I have in the iPad um, that might do some funny things, but I hopefully it should not be that bad. So if I share the screen and then start broadcast, and then I have to change to the little software that I have here, sharing it, which is as here, Ooh, um, you have beautiful flat beautiful field, field <laughs> here, but let's go to say, okay, we want to go to, to, to Nightbed, so I actually wanted to go, go 
to go back. Uh, we we want to go to M. Let me try. Let me type. That's actually really cool though, having a tonight's best option. Yeah, well. but I want to type. I, I know where I want to go. <laughs> We're the experts here. We know where we want to go, telescope. We're in charge. Uh, M8, the Lagoon Nebula. So I can select that one and say, go to. And hopefully you will see my telescope moving. Let me put this in. You, you can hear it. Well, most of the time, astronomers spend hours and hours fighting against technology, okay? <laughs> Trying to develop code, make a telescope work, and, and well, it's crazy. Yes, yeah, so I, I don't want to say it aloud, but so far technology is behaving not that bad for us tonight. Touch wood. So it's, it's going well. So what it's doing now, let me put again the full screen, it is just checking the position. It is very clever, the system checking. No, I'm not exactly in the position. So let me go and, and, and center it slightly and trying to get an eye validated center or not, solving, plate solving, with detected a, a thousand and hundred and forty on a start is still not exactly what it should be, of course, because I have not tested it today and the coordinates are not completely accurate. Um, so hopefully solving and target is centered. Ooh. Good. So there we are. That's so there we are. And then it that should using, sorry? It should show What's that program that you're using? Ah, that is the ZWO uh, as here. Ah. So that is the one controlling because I'm controlling, you cannot see it right. Ah, yeah, you can. I'm using this little device yes, here. Yes, yes, yeah. That is uh, a very clever Ooh, ras satellite. Raspberry Pi. Yeah, there it is. That looks like a space station. That's a space station. Uh, check. You can't see it, but. Check. <laughs> oh, actually, yeah, I can you check. You can on, actually check. I can check on Stellarium. Wh while you check that, um, let me try to explain a bit what we are seeing here. That is a not very fancy image, of course, because, well, it is only a couple of seconds. So let me. But but again, but still, you can see there is some kind of nebulosity there. Uh, let me just take a quick image, 30 seconds. Um, and also, while that is going, something else that I need to do is start guiding. And I have a very nice guiding thing. And to one. And what is done, it is using the small telescope that you see on top of uh, the main telescope. It's going to be observing, taking many images. And that is the same way we are using in professional telescopes. Uh, you, taking many images every one or two seconds. And we have a plane. Sorry for that. The noise. And after, when, when that is done, it's going to correct slightly the position and be sure that always the star is in the center. So here it is. So yet you have an image of life that we, are, that we just uh, got of, the, uh, of this star forming region, the Lagoon Nebula, one of my favorite objects, uh, with plenty of stars and the gas and so on. It looks so beautiful. It is stunning, isn't it? it? And it is just one single frame. Um, I also didn't check if uh, the game, well, actually, there was a couple of things that I didn't do properly because we were doing other things. So let me just quickly be sure that uh, the cooling should be to minus 20 because uh, it is refrigerated and it will be a bit less noisy. But what I want to show you, it's something different now because also, the other thing that we use a lot in astronomy, and that is uh, something that we can discuss and talk a bit more if you want, it is that, uh, although you, you already mentioned it, that we are using filters. Mm. Filters are very important in astronomy. A filter is something like this. Uh, let me show you. It's like that little thing that perhaps you cannot see very well. It is just uh, <laughs> that you put and use decide, okay, let's go to get only the red color or the blue color or the green color. Or we can do something special. We can say for nebulas, we know that this is the gl glowing gas because of uh, the very massive stars emitting a lot of uh, ionizing uh, radiation, ultraviolet radiation, and the, the, the gas itself is glowing in very particular colors that are the chemical elements that are inside the cloud, in the sense, for example, hydrogen. So there is a very famous feature that we call H-alpha or hydrogen alpha. We love the H-alpha. And, uh, and we can, we can uh, and there are many, many astronomers right now, that uh, we can 
manufacture filters that only allow to pass that light, H-alpha. And I have one of these filters here, so I can change the filter to the H-alpha filter. You can change this in the app? Yeah, I can change it in the app. So the filter, what? it is, I have a filter wheel there that is a black big thing there uh, with seven filters, actually six, yeah. because one of them, it is dark for just not getting any, li any, any light. It is very important. Then I have the blue, the green, the red, the H alpha, the oxygen three, yeah. and I'm missing one, which yeah. I don't remember. No, and, and, yes. Sodium? and no, 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 I don't have that. No, 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 it should be three, three, and open, of course. Open, uh. open, dark, and then the six filters. Why we're doing that? Um, I should be exposing because it is already with the H alpha filter. Um, and we have to wait. We have to be passing. In a but in the meanwhile, why this region is so important? Because before we were watching the um, Omega Centauri mm. uh, stellar cluster, right? Uh, a globular cluster. The, yeah. yeah, the globular cluster that looks like some sort of swarm of stars. Yeah. And this is the precursor of such a cluster a huge region where stars are at this moment being born, you know? And the other, the Omega Centauri cluster is the example of a very old cl cluster that sees that it's as old as the universe. So this is yeah. the, the connection between this fuzzy image and the other pointy with little stars all around. Mm. It's the, 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 the predecessor, right? So, yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, um, there is a connection between the different kind of celestial objects that we see, uh, they are very much of definitely connected to the stellar evolution, all of them. Mm -hmm. That is, let's say, the first stage. I start from in region. It is where the stars are born. Many of these stars that you see, uh, they are in, in, in now, now not that clear because now with the hydrogen alpha filter, what we see it is plenty of gas. Um, probably I should play a bit around, uh, around to the... Um, Sorry for that. Uh, to try to get a bit of contrast, a bit. Better what contrast. I actually love about these uh, these structures, these these beautiful sort of um, these open cluster structures that, are, you know, that, that have these wonderful envelopes of uh, of H alpha gas around it, is that the the stars in the center, the white star that we see there, they so they've got such powerful strong wind and UV radiation that they're carving a hole into the actual gas. And that's all we're seeing. We're seeing like a whole lot of structure with inside the gas itself. And I always think it's really pretty. You actually see the, the, the action of the stars itself. Mm -hmm. Even though they're not touching, they're just pushing out these strong winds and they're just sort of creating this, this cavity in deep space. And these aren't small cavities. These are, maybe like, you know, these are light years big or sometimes 10 yeah, yeah, years they're big huge. or 20, yeah. 30 light years big or sometimes hundreds of light years big. And there's quite a lot of gas there as well. So they're quite violent, these young stars, aren't they? Yeah. Well, they are very, they're 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 very, <laughs> very important for understanding galaxy evolution mm. because the massive stars, they are not only uh, releasing to the interstellar medium elements such as oxygen when they explode as supernova. That is, they are, all, they are also injecting a lot of um, what we call mechanical energy into mm. the interstellar medium in order that the gas start to be very turbulent and it is able even to trigger a new generation for stars which is also very cool that, that is why they also they, they, they play really a key role in understanding galaxy evolution something else that i love about this kind of images of nebula particularly when you put h alpha you just see there are also patches of black mm, those little globules the, the dust in the nebula because again we we have we are seeing this in just uh, 2d but actually it is a, a cocoon I should try to think about that is in 3d a cocoon that uh, that we are able to see some patches, one part, the other, some, some uh, walls and some very dense regions that have plenty of molecular gas, that have plenty of dust. And perhaps even in some of those uh, globular uh, dark, um, objects, dark globular objects, there is uh, some few suns that are going to be born very soon because the gas is condensing, condensing, condensing to form new stars. Mm, I like to explain it. It's like a glass of Milo. So when you put your Milo in your milk and you mix it all up, it's all really clumpy. Yeah. And those clumps, they have more matter and so therefore more gravity and they pull from the less dense milky regions of the nebula. And then if you like a you have a star. Yeah, yeah and, and, and potentially a baby solar system will fall in as well. Indeed. 
that's really cool. The other thing I love about the massive stars as well, I promise you to mention this earlier on, was um the, the massive stars that we see today, the most of the bright stars that we see today, uh, you know, we're kind of lucky to see them because they don't last very long, these big mm. stars. They last maybe 20 million years, which seems like a long time in our lifetime, but astronomically, that's not very long. So they're gone in 20 million years and then the universe never sees them again. They do, never. Their gas spreads out and their debris spreads out and they just go on to become future generations of stars and planets and, you know, in, in a certain part of the universe, humans. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think I think we're very lucky to see some of the stars that we have in our sky, the big stuff, the big bright ones because, you know, people, you know, yeah, yeah. In, the future. in the future definitely yeah very very far future but yeah so the more <laughs> massive a star is the less number are there there is actually uh, a function that we call the initial mass function of a stars so in a star forming regions in a star forming region there are many low mass stars that are even smaller than the sun that have been created some not, not as much but still a lot of stars with the mass around the sun but only very few of the massive stars mm, so i think less than one percent of all stars in the galaxy are these massive these massive, massive stars, stars. Yeah. and on top of that the very very massive ones uh, that usually they end up in their lives after the supernova explosion as a black hole they are uh, in the last stage it is uh, the phase that we call wolf rayet yeah. Mm -hmm. That yeah. for this, for example, we only know around a hundred mm -hmm. of those stars mm -hmm. within the Milky Way, which considering you know the how many two hundred billion yeah. stars in the four hundred yeah, yeah. yeah. billions of stars in the galaxy, then no, not as many, not as many. But mm -hmm. again, when they explode, they will do many, many funny things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, especially that's... with the number of like huge spectroscopic surveys that we have, like we. We have the capability to find lots and lots of stars and catalog lots and lots of stars, and yet it's still only a few hundred. Yeah, yeah, and 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 we we're talking about stars being shoals, and the Wolf Rayet stars are the most absolute shoals in in the universe. They put on these beautiful displays of, you know, puffing out their their outer layers and producing these beautiful structures with nebula right around them, which are ignited and sorry lit up by the actual star itself and the radiation from the star. So really wonderful stars to look at and photograph if you if you can. I've never been up to myself, but yeah, if you can. Um, but let's go back to uh, filters and the different colors, because uh, something else that I wanted to explain to uh, to our audience tonight, it is that we are majoritarily using uh, grayscale cameras, I mean, black and white, for example, this one I forgot to mention before. So the way that we get the color, Usually, it is getting images in different filters, and you associate the blue image that you take that you have taken with the blue filter in the blue, the image that you took with the green filter in the green, and the image that you took with the red filter in the red, and you do a bit of Photoshop, which is not Photoshop; it is just merging them together to try to create They're that still image. Real images. They are They're still real fake. images. They are not fake. It is not Photoshop. We can use Photoshop for doing that, but that doesn't that mean that the image is is a fake, definitely. Um, so for example, for this one, I can show you a combined image. So let me uh, share the screen and hopefully this will work at the very first time with this one. There it is. So that should be uh, the uh, Lagoon Nebula, where it is. Uh, there it is. So that is the same object that we have observed right now. We're seeing your your zoom screen still let's stop share iPad. there it is there okay go. thank you oh, that it is that. that it is uh, sorry for that so that is the uh, uh what we were just looking at yes yeah, what we are looking at but in this case uh what uh, i used was in red color it is the hydrogen mm. so in, we were just seeing with the telescope yes what we just we, what we just saw with the telescope in uh, blue it is just a filter that is allowing just the blue light in order that we can see the stars. Very good choice, blue to blue. And that is why you see many of these. Uh, um, um, there it is. Uh, that is why we see many stars here with this color, because usually when we observe with these special filters of hydrogen, for example, of oxygen, which is 
the green color, the oxygen three, with square brackets. Don't forget that. Amateur astronomers, <laughs> professional really astronomers, do not forget the square We're brackets. Very firm about your square brackets. Sorry, <laughs> because these are forbidden lines, and don't, 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 because that is for oh, another day. That that that, lines, that, that, that is for another. I read today. I accidentally put something on Twitter with that with that one brackets, and I'm like, oh no. No. <laughs> oh, no. Here comes the Taliban of the brackets. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I. <laughs> It's, it's important because it, um, let, me, let me just say, at least say this, it is important to put the brackets because that have, it has some physical meaning because the mechanism of forming those lines of creating the light is very different to the way that we see the emission of hydrogen. Anyway, green, it is uh, oxygen. Uh, blue, it is just a blue filter. And in red, it is the hydrogen filter. So these beautiful images also help us a lot to understand what is happening in the nebula, what is happening in the star forming regions, in the sense of where you are seeing the hottest region that usually you see that in oxygen, where you see the walls and the filaments that you see in, with some colors there in the red and the, and the dark, and where the stars are. That's really cool. I actually never knew, like, I mean, I've seen this image before, but never really paid attention. But I, it extends out much further than I expected. Mm. Yeah, I always thought the Lagoon Nebula was that sort of that central region there, but it actually does actually spread out much further and further, doesn't it? Yeah, actually, it is connected with the Triffid Nebula. Ah, if you wow. if you take a very yeah. deep image with H yeah. alpha, yeah. I don't think I have it. Uh, that is an explanation. Blah blah blah. I don't want this. But let me show you. I'm not, I'm not going there, but uh, to to show live this just for. Uh, not yep. taking the time, um, but the Triffid Nebula, which is another beautiful nebula, very close to, to the Lagoon Nebula, they're actually connected. Oh, so wow. you see uh, very um, um, images with a wide field of view in order that you see the, the, all, all the region, this region in Sagittarius, then you will be able to see that there is that diffuse H alpha emission, hydrogen emission, ionized emission there, because we are observing to a region that is much closer to the center of the Milky Way that we are, yeah. in the direction of Sagittarius, and that is very actively forming stars. A, a star forming complex, right? Exactly, Ooh. yeah. It is a star forming complex. So that is why it is so rich to, to observe this part of the Milky Way. It's cool to know that like, when you look at those pictures of those really wide views, that your depth perception isn't lying to you. Like they are actually yeah. next to each other. Because that's a really tough thing to do sometimes where you're looking at space photos and like, that galaxy looks like it's a friend of that galaxy, but actually they are millions of light years apart yeah. and nowhere near close to each other at all. They just look like they're there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's like when you're driving on a very long road and you see a, a, a car approaching, you cannot really tell how far the car is mm. for me it's the same with galaxies right yeah the one the one thing i love about seeing galaxy photos is you see the stars in the actual photo and the point stars and they're actually stars from our own galaxy if you're not stars from the other galaxy you're not stars in between the galaxies when, when there probably are a few stars between the galaxies but the stars that we see in our um now, galaxy images are actually stars from our own galaxy. And I always liken it to being like when you're in a car on a rainy day and you look out the wind and you, you focus on the actual window and there's raindrops on the window and they're right next to you, they're right in front of you. But beyond the raindrops, there's trees. And, and that's a very similar thing where you have the raindrops are, you know, the stars in our galaxy and the trees in the distance are the actual distant galaxies mm. as well. While we are talking, I'm moving to another uh, star forming region Ooh. that is very close. So probably it should not take that much to uh, to get it there. Um, not sharing the screen at the moment, so yeah, keep going. You just talk about stuff from in regions and so on, or you can show where these uh, regions are in the Stellarium. You don't mind? I can, and because I don't know where they are, I can show you how to search for things in Stellarium as well. All right, so we're here in Stellarium once again. The the sky has moved a little bit because it's been some time since we've had a look at the program. But a great thing you can do is um, uh, I'm currently on a Mac right now. So if I go Command F, we get to find the Finder, the search window. So where that, are we? That, that, that reminds me. Did you check the satellite? I did, but it didn't it, it, come it up. Was, it was ISS. Oh, yeah. okay. It was ISS. Yeah. I just didn't have them set up on my on this computer. Okay, so Control F, we go and find an object. And where are we going? Uh, to the, no, no, no. We, were, we were in the lagoon. We now lagoon. we are going to the Eagle Nebula, Eagle Nebula M16. So you can either search Eagle, we are actually Eagle there. Nebula or the uh, 
the the Messier classification M16. Either one is going to work. So we click on Eagle Nebula, and oh, there it is, right in the middle of the galaxy. Well, it looks like it's in the middle of the galaxy. It's probably a lot closer. Can you do a bit zoom in? I absolutely can. Zoom, zoom, zoom. So you see, uh, for example, on the other part, that is M16, that is the Omega. And if you go a bit further to the uh, to the top, you will see M20, I mean, three feet, and the Lagoon. Yeah, the, ah. There it is. There, there, there. Okay. We, were, the, we were there just a moment ago. You see the yes. three feet and the Lagoon. All of that, as I mentioned before, it is very much connected. Mm. But now we are in M16. Now we're here. Yeah, now we are there. And, and the okay. image is just coming through. Oh, excellent. I'll just say one last thing about this. So you can see there's lots of information on the left-hand side of the screen. It tells you lots of things about the object, the type of object, cluster associated with nebulosity. That's that's kind of cool. Um, magnitude, so how bright it is. Surface brightness, also to do with brightness. Uh, its position in the night sky. Its position in the galaxy in different, long, in different uh, coordinates. All sorts of other things. What else is interesting here? Uh, distance, 7,000 light years away. So we're looking pretty far with this object. Yeah, 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 nice. yeah, but enough of that, because we're seeing a, not a fake image, but a, not a live image in front of my screen, but we have a live image coming in through Unhold. Yeah, telescope. we are going to do it at the moment. Three, two, one, and trying to get your share in the screen. Go back to the application. That's it. And there it is. Oh, look at that. So that is only a 30 second image of this uh, beautiful star forming region, the Eagle Nebula, see that it. you start to see that region there, which are the famous uh, pillars of creation mm -hmm. that uh, uh, the, the Hubble Space Telescope to one of the very first images uh, when uh, Hubble was active in, in early 1990s. Mm -hmm. So it was a really, really nice, a really nice object. Again, that is only a 30 second exposure using the H alpha filter. It's, I mean, it's nice. We could do better, actually. But uh, let me do at least the trick of, okay, let's go to do, to do this one in oxygen. So let me put an oxygen filter. That is the one you want to see in oxygen. Um, and now I'm going to put not a 30 seconds, but 60 seconds to increase a bit more what we want to see. And now we have 60 seconds to spare. <laughs> this is one of my favorite ones because uh, there's a really cool little globule in here that uh, is, you know, this is a family friendly event, but it is a little bit rude, but it's called the Defiant Finger or the Defiant Hand Nebula. Um, and uh, I will, parents, if you're watching with your kids, maybe wait until they're a little bit older to see this one. Um, or what else could it be? It kind of looks like a tree upside down. It could almost look like a tree. Yeah, but it's a, it's very fun. Um, <laughs> it's, nebula. I see. I see the hand. I see the hand. And do you see? Yeah. But you, do, do you see the eagle? Yeah. Have yeah, you I ever do, seen yeah, the yeah. eagle? Yeah, I do. Yeah, with the feet yeah, yeah. open. Well, we are only thirteen seconds away. Oh, we're so far. We're so far, and we have some. So the point of this nebula is that the darkest spots is where the stars have really been born at this very moment, and since they haven't from helium or hydrogen, sorry, uh, you cannot see them. And they are tied inside those dark cloud, clouds, right? One of the most beautiful photos that I've seen of this, uh, and I love seeing the comparison between the two, is Hubble has taken optical images of it, but it's also taken infrared images of it too. And, and it's in those infrared images where you can see through that gas and start to see those stars as I was talking yeah. about, that are being born inside that gas. Yes, yes. And they were very famous on this, uh, in these objects in particular. And they were called the eggs for uh, evaporating globular AGGs. Evaporating globular blah, 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 something. <laughs> the, the eggs of the eagle. So it was very fancy in that time. So that is, uh, I'm uh, right now sharing and the image that we just took 60 seconds in oxygen so you see that it is much more noisier because okay we, we need to integrate i mean to collect much more light but already we can see differences with respect to what we have before and the first one it is that now we can only see the oxygen coming from the very center of the nebula mm -hmm. it is not all around because only the very massive stars are able to 
uh, emit enough high energy photons, ultraviolet photons, to get the growing of oxygen. Let's say that way. And we can also start to see all the differences and the, the structure of the of the columns that make the, the eagle, the eagle of the of the eagle nebula and six. Recording in progress. We can combine them together and try to create a beautiful image. And again, I cannot I cannot help myself. I have to also to to do that. So let me uh, stop sharing uh, this one because it didn't work before. Um in some way. It's stupid that I have to stop share. Uh, now I have this um, ready for you in here and sharing a screen with the, with my laptop and you see the wow. when you combine with different colors and to observe all the details of the eagle nebula. I can I guess what color? The oxygen is? Yes, you is, can. Is it the blue? It is the blue. Yeah. Very well. In blue, this time hydrogen is green and red, it is a sulfur. Sulfur too. Also with brackets. <laughs> a square <laughs> bracket. Forbidden one. <laughs> forbidden. Everything in a nebula that is not hydrogen or helium must have the bracket because they are forbidden lines. Just, that is uh, atomic physics. But, eh, a conversation for another time. Conversation for another time. And, and sorry, did you folks mention how, how big those structures were? Uh, not. How big are they, Rami? Well, some of the, those finger like structures actually stretch for about I think, seven light years in, in every yeah. size. So they're, they're not small. It's, they're, that's bigger than the distance, which that's almost twice the distance between us and the actual nearest star to us. So they're huge structures. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's really good. What I like for this image, and, and something that I saw for the very first time in this image, is it has some few years. Uh, I took this when I was uh, finishing my PhD in the Canary Islands in 2006, 2007, using one of the telescopes in La Palma in Spain, the 2.5 meters Isaac Newton telescope, uh, with these special filters that in that time were not that common for amateur astronomers. Actually, they were not common at all. At all. Now they are available for amateur astronomers. We are the first one, the professional astronomers, for using it. And what I like to see in this is what I tried to explain before about the cocoon in the star forming regions. Yeah. Because if you realize the blue part should be kind of a spheric, it should have a kind of a spheric way. But that thing here, sorry, you can see my mouse. Yeah, that thing here, it is on top, yeah. in, front, in front, in of front of here. Ooh. You can see a gap. You see a bit of bluish. Thing. There is a gap, kind of a hole through there. And these stars, the very massive stars that are not exactly this one on the top, this one behind, these are the ones that are uh, performing the, the show, that are creating everything around there. So it is another beautiful uh, image. It is incredible. And while we're not necessarily seeing specific colors in these photos, we, we do choose specific colors just to accentuate these features in pictures like this. So again, still real and still very, very beautiful. Hmm. Indeed, this is the Hubble palette. Or... Yeah, that is, so. that is what later, even though it have been, it was used before than Hubble, uh, it was very much popularized thanks to the images of the Hubble Space Telescope. Hmm. Why? Because there were many scientific projects that they wanted to obtain deep images in these particular filters in order that we can understand much better how the massive stars uh, are in the nebula, how the gas is distributed, and how is the interconnection between the gas and the stars. But later, someone realized, hey, we put colors here. We can also create something beautiful. Mm -hmm. And that is when we are starting to be in, the, in that area that is connecting art with science, with astronomy, which mm. is something yeah, that I also love. Now, not, I think you can see on this stream that there's some clouds starting to come in from behind us, yeah. Uh, yeah. building up that, a little bit. That's right. But uh, maybe we have some time for a yeah, few more pro objects. Probably. It is already 7.30, so but we're still at least one. Rami, do you have... Uh... No, I don't, unfortunately. I was actually, I was, I, was try, I was trying to get the comment, but something played around my telescope. So 
Um, but at least mention about the the comet. Yes, yeah, so there is there is a comet in the sky at the moment. It's not a very bright one. We had a very bright one last year in December. I think it was December. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. This one's not too bright. Um, it's called it's called K two Panstar. Uh, it's not far from Antares, which is in the heart of Scorpio, which is directly above us at the moment. But it's um, it's it's yeah, it's it's fairly it's it's only a magnitude six point seven, so it makes it uh, hard to see uh, even with telescopes. Uh, whereas the one we had last year, Neowise, was actually quite large and um, had a big coma and a big green sort of color to it, which was lovely to photograph and lovely to see, uh, you know, through a camera and your own eyes as well. Um, uh, this one's actually quite a big comet physically. It's, I think it's about, I think they measured it to be about 35 to 80 kilometers in diameter. And we won't get closer to us than Saturn's orbit, where it's going to be um, coming into the back part of the solar system and then trajecting outwards after that. And you can find comets on Stellarium. It's only because I've only just downloaded, it's a little bit embarrassing, I've only just downloaded Stellarium on this computer just tonight before starting the stream. But you can uh, update packages on Stellarium and get new information about new comets that come in when we start to uh, observe them <clears throat> and understand what they're doing, where they're going. So I can't find it on Stellarium right now because I haven't uploaded those patches, but you can do that with Stellarium as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's really cool stuff. Um, maybe we have some time for some questions. Does anyone have any questions from online? And, um, sort of I haven't seen many questions yeah. at the moment. I wanted to mention at least uh, also uh, planet, yep. because you already okay. showed Saturn at the beginning, which is Stellarium. And right now, as uh, and I also mentioned when we were showing all the, the sky map, that Saturn is, is rising and Jupiter is coming a bit later. And the moon should be also rising eventually, but oh, we the are moon not... gorgeous the other night. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was one of these super moons just three days ago. Your favorite kind mm, of uh, moon. No, no, not going into there again. <laughs> so you, you are going to make me, you know, talk about the forbidden lines and super moons in the very same show? Don't know. I'm not <laughs> going to rant about that. Looks, fire up. <laughs> looks like the moon is rising at around 10 p.m. tonight. Okay, yes, a, a little bit, while. A ago. bit later. Um. So as we don't have the moon, I can show some images that uh, my son and myself took with this telescope some few years ago. Also because it is a nice project that I always recommend to everyone. If you have the opportunity of getting, you don't need a telescope as fancy as this one for the moon. You only need a telescope and a way of connecting the camera, a camera that can be even, even the phone into the eyepiece and then just take a very short image of the moon because the moon is very bright and with less than a second mm. you get plenty of light. So let me share the screen again. Hopefully that will work for the first time. Here it is and then going into there. Oh beautiful. So these are images that uh, my son Luke and myself took uh, some few years ago um, when I was trying to teach him how the moon is moving around the around the earth and how that is making the different phases of the moon. Because at the end of the day, we see the moon in different phases because of the relative orientation of the moon, the earth, and the sun, depending on how the sun is illuminating, we see from one place or the other. And we took plenty. And I compiled eight of, of them in this, uh, in this composition here from the uh, crescent moon to the full moon and also to the very uh, waxing uh, small moon. So it is an object that really, if you want, uh, it will be very nice to, to see. And it is a must when we are doing stargazing. Uh, yes, it, it, I know a lot of astronomers don't like it because it actually produces a lot of light, which actually causes a lot of chaos. But, mm. but, 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 you know, we have to always respect the moon because it actually is being with us for so long. It's our companion in space. It gave us a calendar. Yeah. You know, it, we, we, it gives us some. And I, every time I look at the moon from my telescope, to be honest, like I always find something new. I always see always. like, oh my god, I've never seen this crater before or this structure before. And especially when you have like the um, the shadow going halfway. You get those really beautiful sort of longer shadow towards that area where it's like sunrise, sunset on the moon. It's called the Terminator. The Terminator. Terminator. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, Terminator. Yeah. And that, that's that the right name. Some beautiful structures. So if you ever get a chance to look for a telescope, it doesn't have to be a very powerful telescope or even binoculars. Mm. The moon will actually look beautiful um, for you to look at. And, and that Terminator region is really lovely. My favorite uh, 
uh, shape of the moon is when it's a teeny tiny thin yeah. crescent. Like when you're looking at it, yeah. you feel like it might just cut you. Yeah, like it's that sharp. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. And what I like to do, some, but it is a bit tricky to get that for a stargazing uh, night, a stargazing event, is starting with the moon with a very tiny crescent moon at the beginning of the night that you can even see during the twilight and people are enjoying that while starting to recognize the stars from the constellations and then the moon sets mm. and then you have your dark sky for you so you have, have mm. the moon and also the uh, the rest of the sky and because uh, Rami you mentioned about how much light it produces mm. uh, which is annoying for astronomy but even just annoying for looking at the stars as well because the what a lot of people don't realize is that the light pollution and it's we don't really like pollution because it's it's natural and it's yeah. beautiful yeah. but the amount of light that the moon creates is equivalent to the light pollution of sydney yeah yeah, yeah. so it, it takes away a lot of stars when it's, it's full it's, yeah it's so bright like i actually know i actually know when i'm doing my photography uh, from my house which i live right near sydney and it's actually challenging as it is but when the moon's not out i can get galaxies and uh some of the like, like the helix nebula for example but when the moon is out my coloration from the from the helix nebula disappears. Galaxies are much harder. The images yeah. are much grainier. Like it just creates this light fog mm. that you sits know, over everything. But mm. you know, there is a trick of solving that. Not only the light pollution from Sydney, but also the light pollution from the moon that is using one of these special filters I was mentioned yeah. before. Yeah. But, but you can only observe gal um, not galaxies. Galaxies, uh, or, um, if they have a star forming regions, perhaps, but usually uh, nebula. Yeah. forming regions or planetary nebula. We have not shown any planetary nebula. I actually yeah. have an image of the helix that we can show later. But coming back to the moon, something else that is really beautiful to observe, and that is something that I will say, not as professional astronomer or even an amateur astronomer, but just a standard person of the Earth, it is having the opportunity of observing a lunar eclipse. Oh, yeah. mm. And, and we, uh, we were lucky enough to have this beautiful uh, lunar eclipse uh, last year on okay. the 26th of May uh, that I was able to broadcast also from, from here. It was the very first time that I did this experiment of showing life <laughs> how the, the stars were moving around. Um, and something else that I like in, during a lunar eclipse and when you compile and take many different images and pictures together of all the faces of the, uh, from entering to the shadow of the earth, that we didn't mention, but we see the red color because uh, the moon is inside the shadow of the earth. Mm. Um, but, and we see all that process. And uh, let me show you the, if that want to work. Uh, how oh. that is happening and if you see if you align all of them together you will see that the earth the shadow of the earth is perfectly roundish perfectly okay. round mm -hmm. never any funny way so it is an easy observational way that you can demonstrate by yourself that the earth is round it's a beautiful <laughs> thing to do and excitingly we actually have our first question oh. Um, we've got from Sergio on the Zoom chat. Do professional astronomers use different nights for different science targets depending on the moon stage or brightness? And yes, with the Anglo-Australian telescope, which is a telescope that many of us on this table use, except for uh, Rami down the end who does radio <laughs> astronomy, <laughs> um, we do have different types of nights that we can apply for. So there are bright nights when the moon is bright. We have dark nights when the moon is not really up in the sky. And then in between are the gray nights. So those bright nights are the, often the nights that I get because all of my targets that I observe are bright stars. And, Dim, and the dark ones are the ones that Pablo and me want to get. Yes. <laughs> so you guys are get galaxies. Faint galaxies. Very, very faint it's galaxies. A ferocious fight to get dark nights. <laughs> Which is why I'm glad that I only have bright things. So I get time all the time. Yeah, Except to. that does mean that I do get the nights when it is a full moon, which I have to dodge the moon sometimes. One time when pointing mm. the telescope, I didn't check the where the moon was. And then the the picture we got from the, the guide finder was just all white. I'm like, no. what? Yeah. And then I looked out the window and like, ah, the moon. <laughs> that'll that'll do it. Um this is this is this is why us radio astronomers don't have to deal with this kind of stuff. We we in fact we can actually watch the stars during the day and through clouds. Ah, so yeah. even when it is raining, and when it's the raining. only uh, issue, big issue, it is that 
you have the sun. So you have to move away right. from the sun right. in, in, in Actually, daytime. The, the moon does reflect radio waves. Does that affect you guys with your observations? Uh, but the observation that we do in particular pulsars is not, uh, we never look towards the moon because pulsars are so small in the sky. So we obviously aim away from there. Uh, telescopes like ASCAP have actually looked at the moon. Um, so a big telescope out in Western Australia. And they can see uh, the reflection of all the radio waves from Earth on the moon. So uh, yeah, it, it can affect it. Okay, uh, I see that we are starting to be a bit of for at the end. I think we have yeah. another question. Uh, yeah, but yes. before, before answering the question, so I know that we have the question, but uh, uh, let me jump into at least showing some few planets and how we observe planets with some other telescopes, mm. okay? Uh, I know this This is going to be a bit tricky. Oh, come on, and I forgot to add something else here. Uh, my apologies. Uh, let me quickly share again the screen, at least just to for you to have a sense of... Um, what are the images that we get uh, using a telescope, a matter telescope? Although that is not what you will see, and that is not the raw images, and that is what I wanted to, uh, the, the other image that I wanted to uh, to put here. These are two wonderful images that uh, our friend Sandy, Sandy Caselli, uh, have taken recently of the gas giants of the solar system, which are Jupiter on the left and Saturn to the right. Fantastic, beautiful images. Mm. Again, using amateur, uh, amateur technique, techniques, so using this kind of telescope, more your telescope, and a bit larger than this for yeah. getting these uh, the beautiful images, but it is still something that you can do. Yeah, and and, this, and, and actually, speaking of Saturn, uh, today, I think today, or last night, is uh, Saturn is in opposition, which means it's mm. brightest and closest to the Earth. Um, I think I see it too. Yeah, I oh, see yeah. that. I see there. It's, 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 I can it's, try. I can try to go to Saturn. Or if you have a small telescope, have a look at it, and you can see the ring of Saturn. That's actually a beautiful uh, thing to capture. Um, and I saw lots and lots of images of Saturn from around the world coming through on Twitter this morning, which mm. was actually really humbling to see. Yeah, but and and the other thing um, that uh, you can do, and as matter astronomers actually do very well, it is to observe things of phenomena or features that professional astronomers cannot do mm. because our big telescopes are not optimized for observing planets mm. but they can be monitoring every night every moment and observe this uh, for example uh, the transit of the different satellites with the shadows casting over the, the surface of the planet the surface not the cast the, the higher uh, clouds of the planets and discovering funny things that yeah. have been reported and even led to a science paper. Oh, yeah. So this is an inverse eclipse. In some way, yes. <laughs> so we are doing seeing the other way around. While you talk, and you really? talk a bit more about that, I'm going to try to go to Saturn with yeah, my we, telescope. We actually had a guy from our uni, uh, Swinburne, last year. Uh, when I was at Swinburne, sorry, I should say. Uh, his name is Trevor Barry, and he's located down in Tasmania. And he built his own Dovesian uh, telescope, which is the one in front of us. I'm not sure if you folks can see it at the moment. And he actually has been looking at Saturn for nearly every night he can and recording Saturn in um, in multiple wavelengths, including infrared and in methane. And uh, he discovered a storm on Saturn and it went into a paper. Like he was a first, and not even like Hubble saw this thing because, you know, Australia was in the right position at the right time. And, you know, it, it's, it's a really wonderful thing that someone from their backyard in Tasmania was able to actually go and look at Saturn every night in detail. And they actually found some storms on Saturn, which was, remarkable that when you think incredible. about it yeah. i love it when um amateur astronomy gets mm. put into professional astronomy because you know it's all it's all part of it it's all yeah absolutely we, it's yeah. a very collaborative experience and even citizen science can um contribute as well and unfortunately the clouds have gone no, over Saturn. no and i can see that because <laughs> that is it point. is failing to to actually detect uh, to see stars yeah well, in that case, well, we're trying to maybe wait for clouds or not. Yeah, well, we'll try. Let's go on and, say, and answer the questions. Yes, so please. Go for it. Great question. Um, stargazing should be offered to children as it is a perfect time to engage in this beautiful science. What can institutions do? Mm. Host stargazing nights is yeah. probably the, the, the bare minimum exactly. of things yeah. to do exactly. to achieve this. Promote yeah. science communication, right? Yeah. Mm. And, and, one, and another thing that we can also have, and I think this is actually a really powerful tool that uh, many institutions have at their hands and it's not utilized enough, is 
as an institution, you have credibility, you have power, you have influence. You can, as an institution, approach your local government councils and ask them to start making better lighting solutions for your city. So you can have like, you know, lights that face downwards and face instead of facing upwards um, and being a bit more uh, respectful to the dark night sky so that you can actually see the night sky from the city as much as you can and still have suitable lighting for, you know, people in the city. Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. And just getting more people involved as well. Yeah. Um, another great question. You say that every colour indicates a specific gas, but how can you know what gases are out there and what is the importance of being one or the other gas in a specific location? Great question, Paula. Uh, and really the answer is spectroscopy. So we can take, not so much with, actually you can do spectroscopy with your telescope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. We, have been, we have been doing a bit yeah, yeah. spectroscopy. Yeah. I have to, yeah, for the next time, yeah. I will show a spectroscopy mm. live. <laughs> but yes, you, you, can, you can take the light from an object, a star, a galaxy, a nebula, uh, and, and take that light and put it through a very special instrument called a spectrograph that splits that light into a full-on rainbow. And in that rainbow, you can see certain features. And these features will tell us what gases are prevalent within these objects or what elements are prevalent like in stars. And the way that we know which features are for whichever element mm -hmm. is because we test this in the lab here on Earth. So we know very well what features are going to be certain elements. For example, uh, 656.28 nanometers is our very famous H alpha, H -alpha. light. So it's going to tell us about the hydrogen in this object. Um, and there are other lines that I don't know because I just look it up in a line list. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and I can add something very funny also about that in the sense of, of uh, what, you, what you commented about uh, that we know the lines, we know the features because we have measured them in the laboratory. Mm. The first one that the oxygen three famous oxygen three with four brackets uh, was detected in planetary nebula in the late nineteenth uh, century. They didn't know from where that feature was coming. They thought it was something new in the nebula, and they called that, that new element nebulium. Ah, oh, that's cool. <laughs> and later, someone realized that did you add uh, quantum mechanics to explain how the gas is flowing? and not in the first approach, but the second approach, and that is why they are forbidden, then it is when you get these emission lines coming. And that was the physical explanation for that. And that... the thing is that we cannot replicate that emission theory in no. the Earth because we cannot generate that condition. No, no, no. There are very different conditions to ones that we have on Earth. So imagine that on Earth we have uh, 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14 uh, particle centimeters uh, cube. Mm. And in a nebula, we have hundred, mm. yeah, hundred, a thousand top. That is, you know, we are even though we are in the middle of a big thing with a lot of gas and a lot of particles, still the density is very, very, very low so when you compare it, something on the Earth mm. on on the planet. In general, the the emission lines that we detect from different chemical elements are like the fingerprints of our thumb. I love that. We yeah. know exactly which line each element is going to emit. So we can trace exactly what is the chemical abundance of those nebulas and, and, and estimate. It is always an estimation, right? But we can estimate how much helium, how much hydrogen, how much carbon, oxygen, and all the elements that we are able to see, we can determine the densities and the abundances of these objects in the nebula. Mm. And, 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 and the, 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 the spectra of light, what we're talking about, has so much beautiful data. It's amazing how much Actually, everything we know about the universe is from light. I mean, there's a few new things like gravitational waves that are teaching us about different objects in the universe, but nearly everything else in the universe we know about is from light. So mm -hmm. we can actually look at the spectra of um, of a, a binary star system, and we can see how those lines sort of move over time, and we can work out how fast the orbit is, and then work out how massive each object is, and how much influence they have on each other, and what sort of magnetic fields they have. Like just from the light. It's, it's incredible how much data we get just from nothing but light. My favorite thing that we can do with light is to work out how fast something is spinning. Yeah. So we, we did this, um, as we as in like the scientific community, I had no part in it actually, <laughs> but um, we as the scientific community uh, figured out how massive the most massive, super massive black hole is, mm. ton 618, using spectroscopy. So this massive, super massive black hole is like 
66 billion suns massive yeah. and that's the like lower estimate on the mass of this thing but how he did it is we looked at the quasar so the really bright material that's swirling around this massive black hole and looking at the light and a certain feature actually the h beta mm -hmm. so not h alpha h beta at yeah. 400 something nanometers or something yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. 4861 yeah. 4861 yeah, yeah, yeah. amsterdam 4861 there you go yeah. um and we saw that the the feature, instead of being thin, it was very wide. And the wider your feature, the mm -hmm. faster the material is spinning. So by looking at how wide that feature is, they were able to estimate that the material was whizzing around this black hole at like 7,000 kilometers per second. Wait, Jesus. Astronomical. So I will say in summary of all of this that uh, we can enjoy a lot of these beautiful images that uh, we take with amateur telescope and also with professional telescopes and that we can get information about that. But right now in astrophysics, the huge majority of the information is really have is really coming from the spectroscopy with mm. all this information that we are talking about. You are analyzing the spectra of stars. We are analyzing the spectra of galaxies, not only finding plenty of, in your case, chem of chemical elements around there and the properties. And, and molecules you can, too. Molecules and yeah. how you can measure the rotation of the stars and the other, other properties of the stars. In our case, um, measure how many stars are forming a galaxy per year. Um, the relative importance of the young, young stars and old stars, uh, how is the galaxy rotating and that measuring the amount of total mass, including dark matter, and many, many, many other properties, the chemical composition, definitely the amount of metals, that is something very important for us. But so I think the, the job for an astronomer is to torture light, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's the only thing we have. So we, yeah. we, we need to explore it as much as we can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, moving away, I think we have a uh, uh, last question uh, from also from Paula. Can you tell us something about the Jane WST? It is doing some awesome stuff and <laughs> looking at some <laughs> awesome things and showing us awesome photos from space that we are seeing so much more detail. And Unheld brought up these beautiful images. This is the Carina Nebula. Mm. Oh. That is this, uh, definitely. I mean, it's, it's a real image. Like when I when I when, when I, was, I was said this to my friend the other day when this new image first came out, it was like two o'clock in the morning or something like that. Mm. I just I gasped. I was like, oh, because I, I I was like, that, that's not real. That can't be. But it's actual. It's an actual real image. And, and it's, it's remarkable. But it's actually just like an artwork. Yeah, 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 it is fantastic, amazing. I have seen people printing it, printing them and putting them in their living rooms. And it's trying to put it on that door. On the door, yeah, it's so just, good. it's just amazing, and and that is a, a part of the Carina Nebula that we didn't, uh, we couldn't show before, but still, a star, another star from in region, not the very center. It is mm. an offset. It is quite offset yeah, from yeah, the center yeah. part of, of the of of the Carina, kind the Eta Carina, the, the main stars. But you see all these structures here with the the the, the high density, with all the the dust that is seen that we are seeing glowing very well. With this red color in near infrared, uh, thanks to the uh, James we and James JWST uh, telescope. Um, and and sorry, just to add, the telescope itself has instruments on it that actually allow us to split the infrared light that's coming into the telescope. So we'll be able to measure all those wonderful things we just spoke about, but in infrared light from the telescope itself. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of great science. Exactly. It really is. Exactly. Um, and I'm glad that uh, we got this question because we also included, and I showed you just before starting, a uh, very brand new image of the obtaining with the James WST, which is this one of the center of a spiral galaxy, the spiral galaxy NGC 1635. That is an image that uh, Judy Smith. But she's really awesome <laughs> doing all of this. When, when, did this one, when did this one come out? Uh, this morning. Oh. So I saw it this morning. In some moment this morning, they were chatting and, and discussing oh, wow. about that. And, and this the data were actually taken two or three days ago. Sorry, yeah. can, I, can I just ask? Because um, I might be wrong here, because it looks like actually my favorite galaxy. That's why I, I, I spark up straight away. Because the way the dust structures in the center are coming around the actively massive black hole. Is it supposed to be NGC 1365? One six three five. Oh, one six three five. Okay, all right. Might be not the one I'm looking for then. Well, no, it's really, really beautiful. No, with this, uh, uh, it has this very massive 
uh, supermassive hole in the center that is active in some yeah. way. I think it is classified more. It is a spiral galaxy, which when you see all the spiral structure, although that is the very center of the galaxy. Mm. Yeah. But uh, also, I think, classified as cipher one or something like that because it is active, the, the nuclei is active. And that image actually combines Hubble and JWST data. So it's just uh, amazing to, to get that. And you can play with data like this for yourself if you want, which is essentially what Judy did is uh, she would have gone to get the data from JWST and from HST and combine them together into this glorious photo. Um, and because we're kind of, we're going well over time here, but we're having so much fun talking about space. But if you do want to learn about how to find this data, uh, you can uh, go to my TikTok page at Astro Kirsten. There is a video on there from this week. You can see how you can find the data yourself to play with it yourself too. And Totally recommend it to go and yeah. not not that you need more followers, <laughs> but definitely you you really uh, you really uh, do it absolutely amazing. Um, Paula is still asking, yeah. you know, because she she asked about what about the stars spikes. Mm. That is another that is actually the very first image uh, that was released uh, well, by, by the president of the United States. Exactly, and <laughs> uh, by the James West uh, JWST. Uh, the galaxy cluster SMACS0723 that we see plenty of the started galaxies in the background or we I, we don't have time but <laughs> there is a huge debate right now in the extra galactic I mean the, 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 the astronomers doing galaxies about how real and how far the James Webb telescope the JWST is observing galaxies and detecting in at the very beginning of the you know, of, the, of, the, of, the, of mm. the universe but I'm not going there so it's just amazing the the, the huge amount of data that we are already getting mm. but the spikes the spikes yeah. the spikes yes so why do we see these spikes um well it's, it's really fraction pattern right it yeah. is yeah. yeah due to the the shape of the mirrors on yeah. JWST, although so the, the the main six spikes you see are because of the shape yep. of the mirrors, but you can see this small, thin this, this horizontal one, one as this well. One here. That doesn't come from the shape of no. the mirrors. It comes from the structure of the telescope. The structure, the mm. exactly. Yeah. So um, if we think about a standard telescope, about this one having only a single piece of optical element of a mirror or of a lens, but uh, JWST has how many are they? Seven? Uh, uh, six? No. Six with six the eyes? six mirrors? eyes and the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Six, yeah. Six, six mirrors at the end. And because of, and they are hexagons. They are hexagons. And that is why we have the six spikes, the main spikes. And as you very well mentioned before, uh, before that the second one, the secondary pattern that is coming from uh, the structure holding the the secondary yeah. kind of secondary mirror. I think that this telescope had to unfold in, yeah. in the in the middle of the space. We we, we saw it while it was uh, packed, yeah. completely packed, and once it got to the required position, it started to operate and put in the mirror properly. Mm. Yeah, it's it's an engineering marvel when you think about it. Like we we said, we sent something out into deep deep space to a point where if it didn't work then we would have just vaporized $10 billion because there's no way humans or robots can go out there to fix it. It's a bit mm. further than, than what Hubble was. Who was so Hubble's a bit closer to Earth. So. Yeah, that's a bit <laughs> so like Hubble. It's so only Hubble some few hundred kilometers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah actually. This, this one's actually really fast. So if it had broken or didn't unfold properly, then it would have been a bit of a disaster. But, mm. you know. We just, were all very worried about that. Yeah, yeah. But we're so happy that it's working. But well, everything yeah. worked very nicely. Yeah, so it was worth it all the uh, waiting for it. And um, yeah, that's, no. why, that's why I've been calling it a just wonderful space telescope. Uh, I, I like that. Just waiting telescope. Just but no, waiting. no, no, no longer waiting anymore. <laughs> so it just kind of died along. Um, Angel, oh, you, you see Saturn. You see Saturn. Okay, it's all it's it's eight. We said that we were going only to be. Let me try again if that wants to go and let's see. Show Saturn. I think we can. Like Saturn's a good place to end on. Oh. It's just a gorgeous. And it's a perfect map to do it on. But it is. opposition line. But 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 again, I, if in case we can get it, Saturn with my telescope with the configuration that I have, it's going to be tiny <laughs> oh, <laughs> because you need to put a lot of some um, lenses yeah. for 
getting you know a higher magnification let's say it that way and right now i actually have the opposite i actually have what we call a focal reducer in order that we have a very very low magnification to see large areas of the sky but anyway it is trying to go uh validated center or not solving 199 targeted center okay targeted center so let's see what we can get here uh, you are going to be very disappointed. <laughs> Let me try to get a very short exposure and let's see if I can. Ah, oh, wait, I'm not sharing. I'm not sharing the screen. Not yet. I'm, not yet. Uh, let me let me do that first. Let me do that uh, first. One sec. I'm going to close here. Share content. Screen. The broadcast. Three, two, one. It should be. Come on. Sharing the screen, let's go to us here. So that that was actually that is actually Saturn. So yeah. it, it doesn't look much. I I, thought, I was telling you that this it's moon and I'm using a very large field of view. Um, but perhaps taking a is that, very is that Titan. Is that, 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 yeah. that probably is Titan. Check yeah. Stellarium. Yeah. That is why we have a Stellarium. So let's see. Ah, there is it. I need a very short exposure. That was it. Was too much. It was too bright. I, I was in observing nebula. We were observing nebula and stuff from the regions. And it's coming. Yeah, and it's so grand. So already we could see. I mean, there it what's, is. What's, ah, there we go. Beautiful. There it see is. Its shape, its rings. There it is. So it's not very fancy. Again, I'm. I want to, 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 to insist about that, uh, depending on what you want to do, you need a kind of a telescope and you need also a particular configuration. Yeah, and um, camera as well. Like, mm. like, like this is my camera right now is a better deep sky camera than it is the, the like, mm. frame, frame camera, so. But it's still here it is. Yeah. So to try to get you another one. The, the, the moon, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, but okay, again, if we yeah. want to see the moon, then we are going to be saturating the planet yeah, 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 because yeah, the yeah, planet is very bright to, yeah. when we compare to the moon. So as you see, now we see the, the moons, but we don't see the structure. And um, Saturn. confirming from Stellarium, the one immediately below Saturn is so, Rhea. So this this one, this one yep, is that Rhea. that one is Rhea. And then the one below it is Titan. Yes, Titan, of course. Now, Titan's uh, a real special moon, right? Because Titan's the... And it, I might be wrong here, but Titan's the only moon that we know of that has a thick atmosphere mm, in our solar it system. So it's actually got an atmosphere uh, much thicker than Earth, believe it or not. Um, and it's actually a, a, a really interesting place because it rains hydrocarbons like ethanol and it has lakes and it has rivers um, and it has a weather system. And that's mm. pretty cool for a moon because it's actually it's more like a small planet. It is. And you can even, theoretically, you can even walk on Titan without a pressurized suit because the pressure ah, cool. matches mm, yeah, yeah. what it's like here. You yeah. would definitely need some sort of breathing mask because yeah. it would smell awful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and probably toxic as well. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it is also the only other object in the solar system that have liquid yeah. material on yeah. the surface. It has yeah. liquid methane. And so it has erosion it has a, as well. The ocean, yeah. and lakes, yeah. and it rains yeah. methane. That's what Pretty you mentioned. Cool. It's very, kind very of second. Cool. It's a, a very fantastic object to i think to wrap up and finish up so that is the vision of saturn life at the moment i think no no not very exciting as i said uh we need if you want to get a nice image of saturn you need to collect hundreds of thousands of different frames and stack them together with a very particular software and um, play later with uh, uh not, not, not photoshop again trying with some uh, uh software to increase the contrast between you know what you see in the surface when you see the rings and you see different structures so yeah gladly that is uh, nice and i think it is a good moment to wrap up uh let me just stop sharing the screen here and then i'm not sure if you have a, a last uh, comment that you want to mention before wrapping so it is already more than eight so we have been doing it for an hour and a half uh, i hope that everyone online has enjoyed it um, um yeah oh no just uh, to say thanks for joining us everyone um i hope you've had a uh, fun time and i hope you've uh learned something new and found some uh, some of these images that we've seen tonight uh, beautiful so yeah yeah thank you so much
happy stargazing. <laughs> Definitely. I want to thank again Rami, Pablo and Kirsten for being, as always, great explaining things and participating in this event. As I agree, following the question we had before, that we should do more often, oh, much more often. Professional astronomers should do it much more often, and that should be also be very well seen by uh, the, all the all the public. And that is also why we want to thank Instituto Cervantes and also SRAP for organizing this kind of event. Um, thank you very much, everyone. And I'm not sure if Coral want to say anything else before the end. Just, yes, good evening. Just a big thanks. It was wonderful. You make something so far away, so near to us all. I would truly appreciate your time um, and, and for sharing. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. That is. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.